30 minutes, okay, before you have to be under the blanket. Hi, everyone. Hello, everyone. Are we ready to start a show? Yeah. There are people in the chat room. I see you. I see you there. Do you see me here? We're all here. Yes, I have new hair. And we're live. So we are starting in three, two. This is Twist. This Week in Science, episode number 707, recorded on Wednesday, February 6th, 2019. What's the science climate? Hey everyone, I'm Dr. Kiki, and tonight on This Week in Science, we are going to fill your heads with warm thoughts, mouse farms, and fish daddies. But first... Disclaimer, disclaimer, disclaimer. Go. Hang on. We're going to have to do a retake. What, what happened? What the heck happened? That's what I'm saying. <laughs> what happened to you? Uh, the, everything I had just went away. Hang on. You're having right. internet issues. Okay. I'm having massive computer fails today. Uh, the fast pace of current day life. <laughs> <laughs> that is actually, that's how it starts. Yeah. Yeah, I'm looking at it. Yeah. Uh, oh, yeah, I could pull it off of that thing, huh? Yeah. All right, hang on. I'm going to do it here. This will be fine. Okay. Uh, do you want to do the intro again, or should I just jump in? Count three, two, one, and jump in. Three, two, one. Disclaimer, disclaimer, disclaimer. The fast pace of current day life. Life in the information age, where we are surrounded by so much knowledge. An age where we stand on the shoulders of giants, those thinkers and tinkerers of the past. An age where we advance science beyond and above and otherwise further away from where science woke up that morning. And yet, if we look at how we got here, the things that actually led to a bigger brain, or more importantly, the massively increased blood flow to the brain, the running, the hunting, more running, keen-eyed foraging, and more running, and sniffing out dangers, and the still more running, and the careful listening the night, and really just constant running pretty much all the rest of the time, we must take pause and contemplate how differently most of us who don't run constantly are living from the creatures that preceded us. Yes, we have big brains, and we rely on them still for our survival. But there is a distinct possibility that the brains of current humans represent peak human intelligence, in which case we should probably use them as much as possible now before evolutionary atrophy can set in. And how better to utilize a brain of peak intelligence than by listening to This Week in Science, coming up next. Be kind of mind that can't get enough I want to learn everything I want to fill it all up With new discoveries that happen Every day of the week There's only one place to go To find the knowledge I seek I want to know what's happening What's happening What's happening This week in science What's happening What's happening What's happening This week in science Good science to you, Kiki and Blair. And a good science to you too, Justin, Blair, and everyone out there. Welcome to another episode of This Week in Science. We are back again to talk all things science-y from the week. And we hope that you do enjoy the show. Tonight, I have stories about mouse farms, melting ice, and MRIs. Hmm. What do you have for us, Justin? Uh, let's see. I've got uh, adding it up with bees again. Global warming, climate change forecasts. What girls like to do: counting sperm on marijuana, and why all of the gun violence, people? Why? I just want to know why. Blair, what's in the animal corner? I have panda pasts. I have fish fathers. 
And I have rose-colored rodents. Mm. Is that because you're wearing your special glasses? No. 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 Okay. Something special like glasses are involved. Uh -huh. <laughs> All right. Well, let us get down to the science business and party with the facts, y'all. We're going to jump into the show, but before we do, I want to remind you that if you have not yet subscribed, you can subscribe to Twist as a podcast pretty much everywhere you, you find podcasts, iTunes, Google Play, Spotify, Pandora, Spreaker, Stitcher, TuneIn. You can also subscribe to us on YouTube and Facebook. Look for This Week in Science. We're also at Twist Science on Twitter. You can also visit Twist. TWIS.org for more information about the show. But now it is time for science. Oh, right. That. Yeah. Please. Yes. Yes. Let's science. What's she going to say? It's time for what? <laughs> Dance yeah, party? Up. No, we did that. Time for it's, science. Okay. Good. It's time for science. Yeah. Yes. And this is a pretty fun, big story a story of mice and men. Well, a story of men putting mice into into pens. Well, normally when men deal with mice, they're putting them or they're putting out traps for them, or they're hanging out with them in a laboratory, right? You've got the common lab mouse that we use for all sorts of experiments, genetic experiments. But nobody's yet done a fully scoped out natural selection study of evolution using mice. And so a researcher, a group of researchers who just published a paper in Science uh, this last week called Linking a Mutation to Survival in Wild Mice. They did get wild mice. They trapped wild mice and put them into six different fields that they had to... Wow. They dug down into the ground and first they put metal walls around these little field areas to separate them. Three of the fields had sand and three of the fields had darker colored soil. And so the, the study was, right, and, like hold this on, is hold. to see if they would change the color of their fur to better hide in the different colored soils. Exactly. That is exactly what they were doing. And initially, they just had these metal walls that went down two feet. But then they found that these little mice are wild and wily and liked to escape through little cracks. And so they oh, ended no. up having to dig up the barriers and actually put in a cement wall <laughs> around the outside of all of these different fields. Um, but they ended up doing this. They were able to get a farmer in, in a farmland region to agree to give up some of his al alfalfa land to this in the name of science. Mm -hmm. And in doing so, they kind of made friends with a bunch of people out in this rural area. People come by and stop stop off at the experiment to see how the mice are doing from time to time. And so they took 500 wild mice. They took pictures of every single one of them. They took mm. genetic samples of every single one of these mice. And then they split them up through the six different little fields. And like I said, three were sand, three were darker soil. And then they just let it, left it alone and came like back a while later to trap entire... them and see who was left. Yeah, I feel like this entire study was at the mercy of an opportunistic hawk that You're is like, ah, hawks you know, yep hawks. i can just hang out around here for the next couple seasons and i'll just be fine maybe a barn cat or two also a couple owls yeah. exactly so much so you're guessing, you know justin you've you've guessed about this being a test to see whether coat color changes in these populations of mice hypothesis is what justin Yes, they did see a change. And they did. They actually saw over a, a period of several months, they saw a change in the coat color where mice in the sand, lighter color soil pens developed populations with overall lighter colors. And it was enough of a difference that this is something that's visible to the naked eye. It's not something like, woo, crazy, can't really tell. No, this is like, oh, these mice look lighter than the other mice. Mice in the darker soil areas have dark, developed populations with darker 
hair. And they went and they looked at the genetics as well. And they found that the alleles actually changed in these populations. They diverged from each other based on a mutation called agouti. And this agouti gene is known to be associated with survival and coat color. And we've talked about it before. You've talked about the 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 trut foxes. Is it the trut foxes? Fox, uh, yes, the yes. fox truts. The, yes, the, and they became low, lighter coat colored. Their agouti gene changed. As it also they, is associated with that. domestication, right? Yes. Yes. <laughs> uh, but this is still, these, these mice were not domesticated, but they were able to actually find that this mutation, this agouti mutation, and link it to this difference in the groups and the mutated version of the gene actually there's a, a the mutation in the gene affects the ability of melanin to form so that less melanin or the darker pigmentation is actually chemically produced in the lighter haired populations okay. so so here's the here's the thing is i was aware of this study i've heard of this study i know about this study except I mean, I know the result. I knew the result that they that they had uh, had sort of changed in accordance to this the soil. But what I don't know is why. I don't know if there was like a pred uh, predation events taking place, like the my 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 uh, opportunistic hawk scenario that mm -hmm. was simply uh, picking off and then accelerating a natural selection of you happen to have the lighter or the darker coat or what it was, whatever it is. Or if uh, they this was not part of uh, considered an important part of this, but that they were simply adjusting to their surroundings on some gen genetic strategic level. Uh, so I so I don't know how this happened. Right. Well, they uh, found there were avian predators, absolutely, <sighs> that uh, were. A, <laughs> were to blame <laughs> okay. for. <laughs> so this is really a a blending in with the surroundings helped with survival type of situation. Um, so how many mm. generations did this happen in roughly? Oh. Do you know? Be uh, because yeah. so, so now the, the, the experiment is continuing now, um, but the, it's a completely new generation of mice. So this isn't, I don't think it's multiple generations because mice can live up. Mice can live up to two to three years, mm -hmm. uh, in, but that's you know optimal. But, but they can also have yeah. They, have they can have babies. Yes, pretty frequently. So, <laughs> yes, they can have babies very frequently, Lots and so them. new individuals were popping up into this population. Um, and now all of the mice, the original mice, are gone, and it is com has completely gone through so there are no original mice left in because uh, i don't i don't know how old the study is but i i know it's been going on for uh years multiple uh, years yeah, yeah. so yeah. i have to and say so, i'm not so I'm... They, they did i'm gonna say though i'm finding here it was within three months they saw that the rodent's fur had shifted according wow, to which group they were quick. in yeah i i know from <clears throat> my own experience um having mouse breeding at facilities that I've worked at, that there's always somebody who thinks they're they're going to make some really cool looking mice by putting certain ones together for the next generation. Right. And it happens so fast. And then if somebody else comes in and messes up their selection, it gets muddled so fast. And you have those fancy individuals and they you have those those not so fancy individuals. And it's it's a very quick change. So what it sounds yeah. like then is there's a, st a sort of a, a stochastic, is that the, that's the word, um, this to uh, coat color uh, that is is has been a, a, a long term benefit to mice is is the is they travel through different territories over the mm -hmm. many, many millennia, which is which allows for uh, you. You may or may not win the lottery coat color of whether or not it matches the soil well. Uh, but if you do, you're going to be around for the next generation. And if you don't, well, nice knowing you. Exactly. But so so looking looking a little deep more deeply into this, this experiment now has been going on for over a decade. So okay. it's very, very long running experiment. Uh, and the 
the depth that they went th went to, not just showing the change in coat color in the populations with relation to the soil and predation, they're actually showing that uh, there is this genetic switch that is involved and they've linked that genetic aspect to the, a mutation in the DNA to the physical phenotype, the change in the characteristic, the outward expressed characteristic of these mice. And so in doing so, this is, the study is going to really go down in history as one of those, those, those keystone studies, a landmark study, really connecting genetics and the mechanism of natural selection to pop the evolution of traits in a population. Yeah. So this is going to be one for the textbooks. Absolutely. Um, and then another thing for the textbooks, I know, Justin, you've got some global warming stuff coming up here in a minute. It doesn't have anything to do with melting ice, does it? Uh, well, of course, it's I've got, hard to talk. I've, global I've got warming. some melting, melting ice, ice, but mine's, yeah. mine's just the uh, mine's just the forecast, <sighs> not okay. the uh, what's going on right now. All right. Well, you know, since President Trump didn't talk about climate change in his State of the Union address last night. I figure it's a good idea that we do so that yeah. we continue to discuss what's actually happening on the planet and, uh, you know, maybe rally people around some solutions. But it uh, turns out researchers from McGill University, they published in uh, Nature this week a study that is a really pretty huge study modeling or simulating the effects of what's going to happen under current climate policies of uh, to the Greenland and Antarctic ice sheets between now and the year 2100. They, uh, their simulations don't really have much good news for us, um, other than the sea level rise being different in different places around the Earth, the uh, melting water from these large large um, these large uh, blocks of ice on land are is going to raise sea level it additionally though will change ocean currents and because it's going to be warmer melting water going into the oceans it will likely also uh, in addition to changing those circulatory currents also change weather weather patterns so there's uh, some big stuff that's probably going to get going here in a bit and the largest increase in the rise of the sea levels is expected to occur between 2065 and 2075. Mere, it was a good run humans. Yeah, it was near a good 45 run. years from now. Yeah. Yikes, okay. that's we're going to see that. <laughs> yeah. Hopefully. Yeah. No, for Hopefully. sure. I'm going to see it. I don't know about yeah, you. Are. Are. <laughs> I don't know about you. Than, than I. You'll see you'll see many many more seasons. It's not just that I'm younger, it's that I'm determined to live to 200, as we've yeah, discussed many yeah, that's times. Right. That's right. Go <laughs> determination. Um, but in my um, in my climate change communication network, they've come up with a really cool metaphor to explain exactly what you're talking about. about. And it's, um, it's the climate, it's the ocean as the heart of the world's climate. So basically, you have these hot and cold water currents in the ocean, and it's just like how your heart pumping delivers oxygen, oxygenated and deoxygenated blood around your body. And so when you heat up the earth and it heats up the ocean, it causes stress, just like stress on your heart is going to affect its ability to pump. And so um, the idea is that preventative care is the best care for your heart. And the same is also true <laughs> for the ocean. We need to put our planet on our carbon dioxide diet. Yeah, we do. <laughs> So I, I don't know. I would I would immediately stress that the planet doesn't care what the climate is. I oh, mean, no. it, it, in terms no, no, of no, stress no. or not stress or anything like this, but we it care. Is, it, it, it is all of the life forms on the planet that have found a niche uh, within the current climate, which has gone on for a very long time, and can we can adjust slowly, incrementally over time, not as quickly as mice, not three months. Uh, but it's hard to it's hard to point to a lot of species that are going to be more visibly affected uh, than humans. Yeah. So tell me your 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 uh, climate change, global warming forecast. We do love forecasting the future here. Yeah. This is this is uh, the climate forecast. The global average surface temperature for the five period five year period projected 
uh, out to 2023 is predicted to be near or above one degree Celsius above pre-industrial levels. So if this prediction sticks, that would make the decade from 2014 to 2023 the warmest run of years since records began. And these records began in 1850. Uh, so it's uh, kind of just in line with last few years, I guess, the uh, 2015, 16, and 17, and 18 are the four warmest years in the 169-year record uh, data set. So that's kind of a pretty good indication of the trend when all of the warmest years are the most recent ones. Mm -hmm. In this, they also say that we could, you know, there's they're they're predicting the average of one degree Celsius. Uh, this means that we could also easily, uh, well, I say easily. They say ten percent chance at least one of the years between 2019 and 2023 could uh, be 1.5 degrees above the pre-industrial levels. So, climate forecast it's looking. Pretty warm, people. It's looking very warm. And, uh, you know, you get in, we get in conversations all the time, and there are people asking questions. And even on our Facebook page, somebody asked a question rec recently and said, you know, said, uh, I only see anecdotes related to sea level rise. Where's, where's the data? How do you know? I'm, and he, and he says, I'm not a denier. I just don't know. And mm -hmm. so I responded to this person without attacking and answered the question and sent him to places where there are links to actual data and graphical representation of the data to show that it's not just anecdotes. And this is a very concerted effort to understand how change is happening. And so I urge people out there as well, you're talking yeah. to people, don't push people don't push people away with anger and a attacking try and try and actually have a conversation and be friendly and unless people are uh, show animosity to you try and try and feed them a little bit of information and help them with curiosity absolutely there's uh there's been a lot of research that shows that a conversational tone is the first step to getting somebody to start considering um what's happening and that actually they're being fed um, a lot of kind of um, explanatory chains that are missing these huge parts. They're making these jumps from one thing to another. Mm -hmm. And if you take the time to actually explain something very clearly and simply and non-judgmentally, there are a lot of people um, that can turn around pretty easily because if, mm -hmm. if, if you can tell them that it's in everybody's best interest in a way that is, is not just it's the right thing to do because I said so and because science said so, but it, it kind of explains a common interest at the start. Um, there's there it really shows that that there's a lot of people that 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 will start to recognize the urgency and and will be more open to action. I wish that was true. The president <laughs> of the United States said that global warming is a hoax created by the Chinese to ruin the U.S. economy. Like. I mean, he's one person. I, you're and, talking about I'm talking layers about, of reasoning. I'm talking about social science exist. research, social science and science research across party lines, across mm -hmm. ethnic lines, across socioeconomic lines, across the entire United States. And as much as those people might be the loudest that you're talking about, they are not actually representative. And that's what's really important for us to know when we have these conversations. And I will tell you that as much as uh, we have discussed uh, Republicans, conservatives, and the Democrats, progressives having completely antithetical views uh, about the cha climate change science and statements like President Trump and what he has made and various representatives within our government making various st statements, today, this morning, there were simultaneous meetings of the Energy and Commerce Subcommittee on Environment and Climate Change and the Full Natural Resources Committee. They were discussing the need to act on climate change and the costs of inaction. And the Republicans in uh, at these meetings fully uh, affirmed 
climate change as something that is an issue that we need to uh, that we need to worry about. It's the steps that need to be taken that uh, were were not agreed on in these meet in these in this meeting. But Representative David McKinley, a Republican from West Virginia, put it. We all agree, quote unquote, that climate change is largely driven by greenhouse gas emissions. But where we disagree is on solutions. And, and, and so and, on and causation no of those greenhouse gases. It's the tilting of the earth. It's the sun's getting I'm, what I'm saying it's is there ridiculous. that conversations are helping, positions are shifting. We can continue this conversation. Oh, no, absolutely. There's there's more yeah. smart people than there are uh, ignorant people in the world. And it will Yeah, continue. than selfish absolutely. people. Okay, let's talk about bees. Do you have a good bee story? Bees. So, <laughs> so this is... Okay, so colony collapse has been a growing issue in the nation's farmlands. And when I say the nation's farmlands, I'm mostly talking about California because most of the nation's farmlands are California. Uh, where at some point in the season... 80% of the nation's bees are put to work. Yeah, right here in California. 80% of the nation's bees come here to work. A lot of researchers have been spending a lot of time counting those bees to see where those levels are. Turns out, bees might have been counting the researchers right back. This is, uh, turns out, bees, they think, eh, now we can do basic mathematics. This is a building on a finding that honeybees can understand the concept of zero. Mm -hmm. Australian mm -hmm. and French researchers set out to test whether bees could perform arithmetic on the lines of addition and subtraction. So let's see. Uh, there you go. Okay. I'm going to, I'm going to skip all the, like how amazing it is that an animal can think sort of thing. This is by the way, published in science advances, uh, adding space. Adding bees to the list, uh, they've shown previously birds, primates, babies, even some spiders uh, that can add and subtract. Uh, so honeybees, they say, will go back to a place if the location provides a good source of food. And so the bees repeatedly returned to this experimental setup that provided them with yummy stuff to eat. When a bee flew into the maze, they would see a set of elements between one to five shapes. The shapes were either blue, which meant the bee had to add, or yellow, which meant the bee had to subtract. After viewing the initial number, the bee would fly through a hole into a decision chamber where it could choose to fly to the left or right side of the maze. One side had the incorrect solution to the problem. The other side had the correct solution Correct answer was changed randomly throughout the experiment to avoid bees learning to visit just one side of this maze. Beginning the experiment, bees were making random choices until they eventually got to the, the, the yummy stuff. Eventually, over a hundred learning trials that took four to seven hours, bees learned that blue meant plus one while yellow meant minus one. And the bees could apply that rule to the new numbers. Uh, quotey voice, these days we learn as children that plus symbols mean you need to add two or more quantities, while minus means you subtract. Our finding shows that the complex understanding of math symbols as a language is something that many brains can probably achieve and helps explain how many human cultures independently developed numeracy skills. So, according to Scarlett Howard. Uh, How do you differentiate between one of the colors meaning more and one of the colors meaning less versus so, a plus and a minus? So, it is language, but then at the core of mathematics is language. And so, uh, I mean, understanding whether you're saying add or subtract or more or less. Oh, I just mean that you said, you said it, meant, it meant plus one. Right. How do you differentiate that from just there's more in there? But, but what I'm saying is you're making a false differentiation. There is no difference between a plus symbol and saying more. I, I, I'm saying, how do you know they know it's one more and not just more? 
Well, they, I think they do just know it's more. Okay. It's simple math. Right. It's not hard math. But but that is, I mean, that's a mathematical Because that's like, in terms of math, less. in terms of math, that's a greater than or less than symbol. It's okay. not a plus or a minus. Okay. So they understand greater than, <laughs> one, which actually gets introduced much later than plus one or minus one. Sure. And, and, okay. No, I'm actually, I'm actually curious. Is it, Are they actually counting? Are they actually assigning numerical values, knowing that plus one is what the blue means? Or is it just there's more in there? Well, if it if they're learning that uh, that blue means plus one and mm -hmm. and not just more, but mm -hmm. plus one and yellow means minus one, and right. then you go into a chamber or a maze and you see blue, 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 yellow, then mm -hmm. they would know to go to two, or go to the place that represents two or the the, decim the decision mm -hmm. chamber. They would know whether mm. what the answer would be, right? They would be able to understand some kind of complexity of it. So I, I guess I guess the two the, the thing that uh, I again it's an animal intelligence story that is surprising and also just points out just how absolutely ridiculously arrogant humans are. <laughs> and uh, this was like not something that a, a a brain of any size uh, would be capable of. Well, I mean, it's it is really amazing. I mean, we when we discovered that that other primates could count, oh, they know there's more apples or less apples or, you know, there that that other we started figuring this stuff out. And, you know, then it's like, well, they can do that because they have a more complex brain. Right. They have more brain mm -hmm. tissue to be able to do the processing and then to bring situations like this to the point where it's, this is such a basic aspect of animal cognition that insects with tiny brains can handle this kind of stuff because it's important to their survival. Yeah. I see. So sorry, I wasn't totally understanding the methodology here, but that's really cool that they saw like a circle with five dots in it and they knew they were looking for the number five and they chose that wall. That's awesome. That really yeah. is math. Right. They're able. So yeah. there is there is. They're matching or being able to show that they understand these mm -hmm. numerical concepts. Yeah, yep. that's really cool. Good yeah. job, bees. bees. Bees can do smart. pretty basic math, but it's math. Better than like a two-year-old, right? Exactly. <sighs> Poor two-year-olds. They get picked on a lot by Blair. <laughs> I mean, crows are smarter than three-year-olds, so. <laughs> I am. Well, yeah, no, this is this is what we're getting at. How how old in comparison to yeah. a human? Well, and I mean, ultimately, they're just half baked at that point anyway. So it's not that impressive. They're baby brains. They're still <laughs> forming. They're very impressionable. They're very like an empty sponge. Bee brains and baby brains. Sponges <laughs> for learning. Yeah. Yes. Oh, and we just, that was a great story about bees, and it's getting me thinking that maybe we need some more animal stuff going on in here. Is it time for Blair's Animal Corner? I With think Blair? so. Oh. She loves a creature, great and small. Buy a pet, steal a pet, no pet at all. If you want to hear about animals, she's your girl. Except for giant pandas and squirrels. And what you got, Blair? I have some beef for pandas. What? Wait. Shocking. I have some panda beef to express. You always have a beef with pandas. I know, but in this story, maybe it's the pandas that have the beef. Aha! Uh -huh. So panda, do you know what the word panda means? Uh, bamboo eater. That's right. In Nepalese, Nigalia panya, which means eater of bamboo, is the origin of the word panda. And the red pandas are the original pandas. Later came the giant pandas. But they are called that because they pretty much only eat bamboo. And the the conventional wisdom is that pandas giant pandas have exclusively fed on bamboo for the last 
2 million years. However, there's a new piece of scientific evidence at play here. Um, to know exactly what extinct animals ate is difficult, but researchers can get clues by analyzing the composition of stable isotopes in animal teeth, hair, and bones in fossil remains. And in this new study, researchers analyzed bone collagen of modern pandas born between 1970 and 2000 and other mammals living in the same mountains. When they looked at the stable isotopes, they, they looked at carbon and nitrogen from modern pandas and other modern mammals. And they found they, uh, they looked at carnivores, herbivores, and the pandas, they, the bambooivores, um, and not a scientific term. And the giant pandas were unique in their isotopes, as you would expect, because they're only eating bamboo. Next, they measured bone collagen from 12 ancient panda relatives collected from seven archaeological sites in southern and southwestern China and compared them to the patterns they found in giant pandas and the other animals in the region. What they found was, contrary to previous belief, ancient and modern pandas have isotopically different, distinct elements, suggesting that their diet is completely different. So if they were continuously just eating bamboo, their isotopes would be the same. There was more variation among ancient panda species from each other as well. So not only were they not just eating bamboo, but the amount of bamboo and what else they were eating varied from space to space. And the niche that each of them occupied was about three times larger and wider than that of modern pandas. So we've talked before about how uh, radio collar studies with pandas have found they don't really move around very much. And if they do move around much at all, they'll get lost and they won't be able to find their way home. No, no, this is not true. <laughs> yes. Wait, what? Yes, because I, I thought, did that on like, the show thought, ages ago. I thought that they also, though, when when like pregnant, they will eat a different type of bamboo than when not pregnant. And they will go seek out different nutritional. Yeah, but they can get lost and they'll never food. find their home again. <laughs> well, maybe that's not where they want to go back. But to. anyway, not homing but pandas. anyway, um, so. <laughs> They have very small niches, is my point. But these uh, ancient pandas had much larger niches. Um, and so from all of these isotopes uh, that they studied, it's pretty clear that ancient pandas were not exclusive bamboo feeders. So their, their extrapolation from this is that panda diets evolved in two phases. First, the pandas went from being meat eaters to omnivores. And then... Um, later they began to specialize on bamboo. So they want to see exactly how this happened. Did it go carnivore, omnivore, herbivore bamboo, or did it go carnivore, omnivore with bamboo, just bamboo, right? So those right. are two kind of different trajectories. So they want to see how that happened. And they, next step of the study, they want to collect and study panda samples from different historical times over the last 5,000 years, which still cool. not uh, that uh, far considering no. that they thought it was just bamboo for the last 2 million, but it'll be a good starting place. I have a prediction. Yeah. Which we may never ever resolve. So it's a pretty safe prediction. I'll predict that the last type of meat that the omnivore pandas were eating uh -huh. was other pandas no. was another <laughs> form of bamboo eater. Because one oh, of the things that's really yeah. interesting is the microbiome yep. of the panda and the red panda and a, a bamboo eating lemur yeah. share a lot in common with the microbiota. Mm -hmm. that, but that's that, where this that, gets weird. Those specific types of animals don't live anywhere near each other. Don't live anywhere near each other and are yeah. separated by many, many more, like 11 to 80 million years, depending yeah. on the right. So, so this, it's a good but what question. it what it's but what it suggests. Yeah. I mean, we we have talked about the microbiome of these bamboo eaters actually being more conducive to a carnivore a carnivorous diet. And so what it suggests no, to me no, is the, that this the, happened over a very short period of time. 
Yeah. So Justin, wait, about, wait a about a hang year, on, hang on. I got to that. For I can a resolve this. I can resolve this about yeah. a year before our microbiome study that found that pandas, red pandas and bamboo lemurs all had similar microbiome in their gut for bamboo. There was a study a year before that, that the rest of the microbiome in the giant panda gut is for meat. And so there was a hypothesis that the reason that they don't breed well, the reason they don't move very much is because they have a constant stomach ache. Do you remember this? So yeah, yeah so that was that was before. So so looking at their gut bacteria, just the giant panda, they recognized all these enzymes and micro microbiota for meat. Later, doing this comparative study, they found similar strains for bamboo. Uh, so and one of which also is in termites. Like, yeah, that's how amazing this yeah. is. So so part of this could I mean they maybe maybe they're really into, but like it, it reminds me of like the the studies that have looked at uh insects changing their diet based on their microbiota mm -hmm. and if 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 at some point the microbiota of the panda gained all of these sort of plant eating or bamboo specific cellulases to digest Perhaps that was a big motivator, more so than a desire or, you know, interest in bamboo itself. But if the microbiota change, which if you were eating things that eat bamboo, would maybe be accelerated. Perhaps. My theory about all of this is that this is just further proof of runaway evolution, evolution in pandas. Because this was a very short change to a not energetically um, advantageous lifestyle. So if we know it happens so fast, uh, then then there's even more evidence for the fact that it was just kind of this weird evolutionary event that created this dead end, which happens in evolutionary history all the time. Yeah, yeah and maybe, right. you know, they just, they started, they're omnivorous and they started eating bamboo while they were omnivores and then they just got tired, but they were, I can't go anywhere to hunt anything. So I'll just eat more bamboo Absolutely. and there they go. Oh. Yeah. Or there's even something <laughs> weird, like there could have been a die off that created an evolutionary bottleneck. There's any potential, you know, weird trigger system, which is what they're, they're going to try to find out is what this this factor was that created this very quick change in so, diet. So there's also isn't there just the, also the possibility that they were numerous and everywhere? It sounds like they were all over China. Uh, it's yeah. A large area. And and we're and we're actually actually a evolutionary super performer, keeping the populations low enough so that they didn't have an overpopulation boom to over over uh, over the uh, the resources that were available. And we're living in perfect harmony with the environment over a large area until the humans showed up and started eating them. That's what we need to find out. How many hominins were eating pandas? That'll tell the rest of this story. I'm going to guess not because they're pretty dangerous, but we'll yeah. see. Um, all right. Anyway, <laughs> moving <laughs> on, let's talk about fish sex. So. Wait, fish um, don't have sex. This is what you've reminded me over and over and over exactly, and over Exactly. Over over you again. passed the test, why, Justin. That's <laughs> why I should never date a mermaid. Yeah, that's why Shape of Water was very inaccurate. Anyway, <laughs> um, so as you mentioned, Justin, fish do not copulate. The females lay their eggs. The males kind of sprinkle their deposit over them. But that also means that there is a huge potential for cuckoldry in the fish mm -hmm. world, which to remind everyone is when a male who is socially bonded to a female gets kind of sneakily usurped for fatherhood of, of the babies. So when, when the dad is kind of away, another male swoops in, fertilizes the eggs, male comes back, fertilizes the eggs. Oops, it's too late, but he doesn't know. So then he helps tend for and raise babies that are not his. Yeah. Where you're the baby's daddy, you're baby daddy, but you're not the baby's daddy. Exactly. So cuckoldry is really common in these guys, also in a lot of bird species, because the there is a lot of paternal, it, whenever there's paternal care and there's not a lot of mate, mate guarding, this is, there's a lot of potential for this. But when you have external fertilization, the potential for cuckoldry obviously goes way up. Um, researchers from <clears throat> Carl 
Franzen's Universität Graz in Austria, <laughs> so many consonants, looked at cichlid fish and they looked at cuckold behavior, specifically looking at how related the males were to their eggs when they were cuckolded. So was there a relationship at all um, between the male and the eggs that he didn't fertilize? The reason you would look into this is you'd want to see in a social group if any of his brothers or cousins are the ones swooping in. And the researchers found that on average, the cuckold males and the mother's social partner were on average more related than expected by chance. So overall, more times than not for kind of statistical analysis, the cuckold male, the one swoop doing the swooping in, cuckolder, cuckoldy, this gets complicated. The one swooping in on the kind of the father of the group um, and, and edging him out for father fatherhood of the eggs was somehow related to him more than by chance. Well, and it's probably, it's probably the teenage son who thinks <laughs> it's, everything's fine because he's alone in his room, but there's no walls and there's currents. And you really never know how this is going to end. So that would not be an evolutionary advantageous method because he'd be related to his mom still, right? Mm -hmm. And so that would not create healthy babies. However, in this case, they're not related to the mom, but they are related to the, the supposed father. Uh, the whole, you know, you are not the father. Turns out he's related, though. Um, and so the reason that's happening is Luke, actually... I'm not your father, but... <laughs> you are the I'm uncle. Right. You are not the father. You are <laughs> be your uncle. the second cousin. Okay, anyway. Um, so it's complicated the, in space. I yeah. don't even say that. <laughs> so the reason this might happen, um, you can probably guess pretty easily. It's it's right down to the selfish gene once again. Mm -hmm. So the idea is that if you're gonna be cuckolded, I'd rather be cuckolded by someone I know. <laughs> Maybe it doesn't make sense in the human world, but if you're a if you're a fish, it actually does because then if you end up putting all this energy into the eggs, at least some of your genes are getting passed off. So we talk about this as if it's like a hey, I'm so, you know, for this being my right. brother, you know, you know what but I, the conscious aspect of it, the cognitive aspect of it is very likely not there. And so what I'm wondering is if behaviorally what's happening is, you know, as a male is defending a mate, right? Defending mm -hmm. the ability mm -hmm. of other males to have access to the female's eggs as she's laying them. Maybe the defender is a little more lax in mm -hmm. those efforts if there's recognition of some kind that what, however fish recognize each other, that perhaps the, uh, that male doing the mate doing the defending, maybe he's like, I'm going to take it. I'm going to go. I can, I can sleep. This is someone I know. I recognize this individual. Mm -hmm. I'm not going to fight as hard. Maybe threat. they lose the fights a little bit more often because yeah. they're more evenly matched because they're related. Um, yeah. you know, I'm just oh. wondering what aspect of behavior is going on there to allow it to happen. Right. And so what it looks like is mostly that um, it's an allowance of proximity. Um, the idea is related males, quote unquote, work together mm -hmm. to compete against a host of unrelated males. There so you go. can, I'm almost, I'm almost picturing it kind of like, um, like football, like you have this line of related males that are all trying to go in and get the eggs and they're kind of edging out all of the unrelated males. They're, they're defending so their line is, really this is, well. This right? is actually repeated in human history. Uh, when we go back and look at, we did a story about how uh, females uh, genetics were widespread over a region, like females traveled and their genes spread, but there was these consolidations in these, um, these uh, what do you call it? Uh, uh points where the the male genetic population would be very condensed to a single sort of family and it is sort of like that the brothers the uncles the everybody worked together as a team and the women could come from anywhere because they were uh 
patriarchal societies, patriarchal society, patriarchal society or the other way. <laughs> I'm sorry. Was what? You just so, mumbled so much that we couldn't even hear you. That, I'm going right. to just delete that. So what's <laughs> also what's also sort of interesting is like, like the first is like maybe this is why these fish haven't evolved very far. Of course, all life on Earth, pretty much on land, came from fish initially. So what then the question is, is this a really successful strategy, or is this the strategy that was left behind by things that didn't evolve? Because it never progressed to a point where it was so, stronger for their evolution. To your point about the ocean and how stuff just kind of gets everywhere. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, this is a type of fertilization that's very risky and has a huge potential for, for cuckoldry. So knowing that this we I would argue we there hasn't been any research on other species that may or may not do this yet. Um, that's kind of the next step of this is to see whether these conclusions can be applied more broadly to fish, to aquatic external fertilizing animals, to animals in general, who knows, right? Yeah. But the it makes sense that if you are trying to win the evolution game, you're trying to get the most of your genes possible out into the world to the next generation, that this could be a way to combat some of the risk of having an external fertilization strategy. Right. And, and also a good clue to me that the next time I want to date a mermaid, I need to find one with the fish parts on top. Yeah, that's, that's an important part for sure. Um, you wouldn't have a full set of, of chromosomes. Otherwise I don't yeah that's let's always go for the full thing. set let's go for that full set i think this is a good full set of the first half of our show and we have finished that first half we will be back in just a little bit after this short break with the second half of our show we've got what has science done for you lately coming up oh yes people have started writing back in again and a number of other stories i've got new species fmri and lsd and there's more. so stay tuned everyone for more this week in science <laughs> Explain things you've heard more than intuition. A lot of reason shows the way to go. New conclusion. The methods of hypothesis and patients are the only things I need. Put on a pair of goggles and go looking for the things I couldn't see. Thank you so much for listening to This Week in Science or for watching, for that matter, if that is what you are doing now. Thank you for joining us for another episode full of fun-filled science conversation and facts. So many facts and thoughts. We keep bringing it to you week after week. Thanks to you. Yes, it is because of you and your help keeping the show going that we're able to continue doing it week after week. Your donations and your support help us to bring the show to you to maintain our equipment and to just do the show every week. So I ask you to continue to support TWIS. And if you are not supporting TWIS yet, to please consider it. Because if it's important to your life, Maybe help a little podcast out. That's right. We are the longest running science podcast hosted by women. Isn't that pretty awesome? That's that's our claim to flip claim to fame here. Let's keep it going. Let's yeah, keep going into the history books. You can head to twist.org if you're interested in helping us out. At twist.org, you will find links like our Zazzle store link, which will allow you to go to our Zazzle store and find many products with the Twist logo that can help you through your day, like a coffee mug. If you need a new coffee mug, why not make it a Twist coffee mug with our logo or artwork by Blair? Need a new pillow for your couch? What about a lumbar pillow with a mammoth? drawn by Blair. We also have polo shirts with the Twist logo that you could wear to work, kids t-shirts, phone covers, hats, all sorts of great products. Take a look at our store. A portion of the proceeds go to our show and help to support us. 
So your purchases help TWIS. Back at This Week in Science, twist.org, you can also find links like the PayPal link that is on the main page. It just says donate. It's there, yellow, donate. Click on it. It will allow you to donate one time using PayPal at a in a at an amount of your choosing. If you're interested in doing a recurring type of payment, you can click on the most recent episode, go through the show notes, and there are pink buttons down at the bottom of the page that you can use to donate at either two, five, or $10 a month in a recurring way so that you can just set it and PayPal will deduct that total from your account on a monthly basis. If you're interested, in this kind of monthly payment thing, we have another option for you that's not PayPal. It's Patreon. And you can click on the Patreon link on our on our main header bar. It'll take you to patreon.com slash this week in science where you can click on the red become a patron button. Choose the level of your support. You'll be charged one time per month. And this total goes to support us and to help us keep this show coming to you month after month after month. $10 a month. We would love it if you could support us at the $10 a month amount because at that level and above, we thank you by name at the end of the show. We love to say thank you to you. And you'll also get some nifty little gifts in the mail at some point. So $10 a month is about the same as a cup of coffee a week. Why don't you think about it? Think about it. Are we as important as a cup of coffee? I think so. Back at twist.org, if you have not yet subscribed, this is also where you can do that very easily to one of the big three, right? Click on the subscribe button. You can subscribe on our YouTube channel, iTunes, or at Google's podcast portal. Choose one of those, whichever one works for you, or send someone else to twist.org to get them to subscribe. We really appreciate your help. In fact, we could not do this show without you. And thank you for your support. And we are back with more This Week in Science. Yes, we are. It's good to be back. I know we took a little break there. It's so good to be back. Now it's time for this weekend what has science done for me <laughs> what has it done oh last week we had a little break there because we didn't have any letters but the letters are coming in again thank you everyone keep them coming keep them coming so our most recent letter is from someone who has written in previously Ed Gabois. He writes in and says, hello, Twists. I was listening to the most recent episode of the show and I was bummed when you had run out of listener submissions. I love that segment. Well, he's back. We had emailed in April 2018 about how my then three-year-old son had been diagnosed with a crani craniopharyngioma, a really rare type of brain tumor that mostly impacts kids. It can have lasting and severe impacts for the rest of their lives, everything from sight and neurological defects to hormone deficiencies and more. I'm not sure if you wanted to share my update, but I figured I'd give you guys one just in case. So yes, we love updates. Update is... My son is doing great. Awesome. He's a happy and healthy five-year-old. We've started getting ready for his leaving preschool and graduating into kindergarten. <sighs> We've started human growth hormones over the summer since his tumor calcified his pituitary and he's shot up. He's gone from being one of the smallest kids in his class to one of the tallest. He's still on a number of medications several times a day that help us maintain all of the different hormones in his body that regulate everything from thirst to growth to parts of his immune system. But it astounds me that modern medical science can not only do this, but do it so well. He's a completely normal kid. No one knows anything is different about him unless we tell them. And it's all due to modern medical science. If this had happened 100 years ago, I wouldn't have him in my life. But because of medical ago. science... Yeah, 20 years ago even, right? Yeah. 
and a huge team of people who dedicated themselves to making kids well. He's thriving and excited about going to big kids school. We've had four monitoring MRIs since I emailed you last year. We've seen some small expected tumor regrowth, and we have another surgery somewhere on the horizon months or years from now, but our neurosurgeon and neuro-oncologist aren't concerned about future complications. The diagnosis is good. We shouldn't even need another craniotomy. We should be able to just do an endoscopic transphenoidal operation that's through the nose to remove, remove the growth. Yeah. The whole ordeal has left him with a huge appreciation for science. Lately, we've been doing science experiments at home that <sighs> involve, uh, that involve, I gotta get screwed over a little, that involve the, uh, where did it go? Sorry. I was telling the story and I lost it. Blah! Ah, that involved the cold weather we've been having in New England. He really got a kick out of learning all about dry ice with me. Very safely, don't worry, and the water cycle. Keep up the good work, guys. I hope more listeners share their own stories, too. That is an awesome update. Yes. I just love to think about, especially since they're already starting with science experiments, this kid could grow up to discover some cool new thing, be a scientist, be, a, be in technology, be in engineering. You know, there's this entire world ahead that, uh, that this kid could do. Yeah, Seems we great. are, we are inspired by, and you know, our, by our experiences, our experiences make us who are, who we are and kind of shape our interests. And so who knows what, who knows what he will be, but it's amazing yeah. that, because of science and medicine, he's he, we have yet to see. Yeah, we'll find he'll out. get and, to find out. Yeah, this Ugh. is very exciting. So, oh, Ed, thank you great. so much. Thank you for writing in. I love that you gave us an update. That makes me very happy to hear. And everyone out there, if you have a story to share about what science has done for you lately, please don't wait. Send it in. Send me a story at Kirsten, K-I-R-S-T-E-N, at thisweekinscience.com or send us a Facebook message on our This Week in Science Facebook page. Justin, what you got? Oh my gosh. Uh, what story does it say that I have next? What a girl wants, what oh, a girl yes. needs. So uh, <laughs> girls don't want to be scientists, according what? to a new study. Uh -oh. They do, however, love doing science which might sound like this is uh, something that doesn't, huh. can't be rectified. So yeah, so according to this, asking uh, young girls uh, if they want to be scientists uh, is not effective, but asking if they would like to do science leads them to show a greater persistence and in interest in science. Really strange at the outset. So describing Science's actions by saying "let's do science" leads more science and leads to more science engagement than does describing science in terms of identities by asking them to be or pretend to be or act as if they are scientists. It explains Marjorie Rhodes, an associate professor at NYU's Department of Psychology, senior author of the study, which appears in the journal Psychological Science. These effects particularly hold for children who are the target of stereotypes suggesting that they might not be the kind of person who succeeds in science, in this case, girls. Yeah, so this is, and this is sort of following on a subject that we have talked about a bit on this show about women in science and the need for role models and for young girls to see uh, girls as or women doing science that they can, you know, sort of plot the path on. But very interestingly, I, I think I've known, noticed at least when we've gone out to the STEM events, it's, it seems like it's mostly girls <laughs> doing the, the science, like the, the entire row when we were in Philadelphia, it seemed like everybody who was just about doing robotics and programming was female. And again, they had uh, one person, one female who had started her own computer club, who also created a lot of interest and excitement and did a fantastic job there. But I think it's very interesting, uh, and motivationally, that these these young girls are interested in doing the work 
of science, but not in simply the role play aspect. Um, so a couple of things. One is that I've talked on this show a bunch about how I somehow was never explained. Nobody explained to me that if I wanted to work with animals, that was basically science. Nobody explained that to me. But so I, through high school, pretty much until college, I was like, oh, biology is not my best subject. Chemistry is not my best subject. Physics is not my best subject. So I don't want to do science. But if somebody had said, oh, if you want to work with animals and you want to understand their evolutionary history and you want to understand their behavior and their diets, that's science. I think there's this there's this miscommunication of of activities that are science related and what is science, just like the whole conversation of what is a scientist is this kind of big, amorphous, mixed up ball of yarn. Right. Yeah. But I think to your point about Philadelphia and I, I just, I don't know, we didn't count heads or anything like that, but I can't help but wonder because we have a societal expectation for who does science and it is not female. If it's kind of that thing where, um, in a boardroom, if a woman is talking 50% of the time, public perception is it's 80%. If it's because we saw so many women, it felt like it was more women than men. Just because it wasn't anticipated, well, it it could be, but I, I I didn't I don't think that I walked into it with that presumption, and 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 the, and I'm saying and it's a societal I, presumption that right. you can't help. Well, I don't know if I, I I'm pretty sure I don't have this, but one of the one of the things that I thought was interesting in this uh, also the, the discovering this study was that boys before the age of five were interested in doing science more than being called the scientist boys after the age of five were actually uh more likely to be prompted to pursue a scientific activity if they were being scientists rather than the idea that they were doing science so so it may be that the root problem in all this is that as as boys grow up they have a stronger uh a, a affinity for identity combined with profession that women may not, that the girls might might continue to go. It's about doing, not the being. And that, that that's why <laughs> all of the misogyny came about is because boys identified this is a thing that boys do. <laughs> and and yeah, separate I, it, from being interested in doing the work. Yeah. And I, I wonder, I mean, there is uh, the aspect of girls not competing as much when they're younger and being more likely to work together in small groups where boys are a little bit less able to to uh, to do well in those situations all science is collaborations like exactly that. and i'm just wondering you know there's the identity versus action based language um you know it, it maybe using particular phrases in talking about it is is a way that we get different segments of the population the child population yeah. into things you know you go oh well do you want to be a scientist? No. Oh, why do you want to do this thing that has science in it? Sure. That sounds awesome. So, so, <laughs> the, so sort of the, the idea though, is if you had a young scientists club uh, based on just maybe this a one girl study. wouldn't necessarily, uh, little girls right. might not sign up. Right. Yeah. But if you had a wetlands exploration club, mm -hmm. like then the population, so it's it's a very interesting uh, at least yep, yep. Uh, 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 enticement to educate and uh, a tool that could be used and how we approach getting people interested in these activities. Absolutely. How do we interest people in the science? In the science, how about we interest them with just cool things like finding new species? It's always yeah, exciting. That's always, when... that's always an exciting. What do we find? Some finches? Some monkeys? What were they? No, no, bacteria. Oh, that's important too, actually. Yeah, <laughs> in the human microbiome. Oh. Yes, a uh, reported on February 4th in Nature Biotechnology. Researchers from the Welcome Sanger Institute, Hudson Institute of Medical Research, Australia, and EMBL's European Bio Bioinformatics Institute 
they created the most comprehensive collection of human intestinal bacteria that the world has ever seen. Mwahaha. Ha, ha. yes. They uh, created this collection of human intestinal bacteria to create a baseline, really, to figure out what is living in us. Because at this point in time, we really haven't been able to get a handle on everything. And we have little ideas here and there, but don't really know. And so researchers studied fecal samples. This is the best part. Yes, you too, children, could study bugs in poo. Fecal samples from 20 people from the UK and Canada and grew the, and DNA sequenced 737 individual bacterial strains. They isolated bacteria and, and, uh, and, and analyzed what they saw there and revealed 273 separate bacterial species, including 173 that had never been sequenced before and 105 of them had never even been isolated before. So they had never huh. even been seen genetically before. And so the researchers are very excited to be able to have this new culture collection be, uh, you know, basically be reference genomes for uh, researchers to determine the regularity with which different bacteria are present in healthy individuals and in diseased individuals and to start figuring out what role bacteria play in our health a little bit more specifically. A hundred, over a hundred new species by looking at human poop. Yep. And, and again, right. this is also uh they Fair didn't even warning. have to go to like an isolated island in the middle of no. the ocean. No this Mariana's thing. Trench. No. No, you know, no man is an island. Sorry. There you go. So there you go. But this is this is also uh for anybody who's who's seen adver advertisements, advertisements for probiotics. Uh for anybody who's been subject to a diet of one. Type of, you know, nutritionists, probiotics, people who are proclaiming these things. Oh, yeah, they don't know anything. Obviously, they were missing a ginormous part yeah, of that's a good the point. equation. So once again, they have to start over. So I'll throw it on my yogurt, is what you're telling me? Or? No, I'm not saying throw okay. it your yogurt. I'm, but I am saying that, you know, we're, yeah. we're still at the, at the beginning of this huge story of the human microbiome. Mm -hmm. And this uh, this new revelation says, ah, maybe even earlier than I thought. Right? Yep, so. exactly. Yep, yep, yep. Yeah, so all of these, these pop diets and microbiome, this and that, yeah, take it with a grain of salt. But, you know, eat your fiber. That's what you do. And and with so salt. so put your salt on your fiber. On, your fiber. Yeah. on the put your salt on the fiber. There we go. Yes. Tell me another story, Justin. All right. I'm still searching for the rundown. I know I have it somewhere. But, but what what would you predict the next story to be? Uh something about guns. Ah, mm, oh yeah, okay. Guns. So this is a horrible story, but it's one that needs telling. So each year the estimate is between 75 and 100,000 Americans. It's one country alone, although that's probably the largest number. Are injured by firearms. Thirty to forty thousand of those, or thirty to forty thousand additional, die from firearms. And this is according to the Center for Disease Control. Uh, Vietnam War lasted roughly twenty years and had around fifty-eight thousand U.S. casualties and countless more on the other side. The magnitude almost. So in two years, we're outpacing a 20-year war in the amount of firearm deaths in this country. It's a serious problem. And one thing that uh, as a response to this, uh, that's sort of a common trope, is that something should be done about mental illness, that we need to address this uh, in response to uh, the, the mass shootings or just the general level of gun violence in the country. So according to this study, 
a better indicator of gun violence than mental illness is access to a firearm oh. is actually a much greater indicator of potential gun violence than any form of mental illness. This is uh, researchers, <clears throat> University of Texas Medical Branch, Galveston. They looked into the association between gun violence and mental health. The results are published in the journal Preventative Medicine. Counter to public beliefs, some public beliefs, Cody voice, the majority of mental health symptoms examined were not related to gun violence. This is Dr. Yulu, postdoctoral research fellow at the University of Texas Medical Branch Galveston, uh, also the leader, author of the study. What researchers found instead was that individuals who had gun access means they can put your hands on a gun were approximately 18 times more likely to have threatened someone with a gun. Individuals with high hostility were three and a half times more likely to threaten someone. So it's not even like the highly hostile people. The people you would expect, like that person would pull a gun on somebody at some point because of how highly hostile they are. Oh, what was that? Five-ish times less likely to pull a firearm than somebody who just happens to have one around all the time or have access to it. Uh, huh. Anyway, that's kind of all I really have to say about that study. That's um, a pretty decent argument against people having ridiculous access to guns all the time guns guns don't kill people i've heard this before people with guns do kill people mm -hmm. uh however and people with guns who kill people kill people with guns just to get all the way around <laughs> that's how that works statistics are interesting just it's like bees could do this math Right, the bees <laughs> could figure out that it's like okay, this is a subtract the gun and there's no gun violence. Add a gun, gun violence. Yep. That's how that works. That's pretty it's much really that cut and yep, dry. It's access. Yep. Then I don't like it. I don't like it. But yes, maybe we can do something about it eventually. Fingers <laughs> crossed. <laughs> uh, but in the meantime, let's talk about our brains. Sure. Work and what is consciousness anyway? What is it to be conscious? Two studies this week I thought were very interesting came out and about uh, related to functional magnetic resonance imaging of the brain and how it acts in different conscious states. And in one, researchers published in Science Advances this week, um, a study of individuals in vegetative state versus minimally conscious state versus conscious. And so they had 47 fMRIs of healthy individuals and 78 patients who either had unresponsive wakefulness syndrome, which is a vegetative state in which patients' eyes open, but they don't exhibit any kind of voluntary movement whatsoever, or minimally conscious, which is defined as having complex behaviors like eye movement that can follow an object, but not the ability to communicate any thoughts or feelings. They did these, these scans in Paris, New York, and Liege, Liege Belgium. They looked at what they, they for about 20 minutes at each, on each patient, trying to find identifiable, identifiable patterns of activity. And they were able to reproduce four specific patterns from the data and that was very consistent across facilities and across individuals. Two of the patterns, the likelihood of the occurrence depended on diagnosis. Healthy individuals were more likely to display pattern one, which is high, what they call high spatial complexity and interregional complex connectivity. 
which basically means there's a lot of stuff going on in the brain, right? Patients with the, um, the unconscious or unresponsive wakefulness syndrome, they really didn't have that very often and were most often seen to display pattern four, which had low complexity and low interregional connectivity. And the MCS patients are minimally conscious fell somewhere in between, and the occurrence of patterns two and three were kind of evenly spread across all of the patients. They looked at another set of patients in Canada and were able to identify again the same four patterns within the fMRI images and uh, were able to connect the uh, the diagnosis with the patient patients based on these signatures. Six of the patients had the unresponsive wakefulness syndrome and predominantly had this pattern four, and the other patients had what's called cognitive motor dissociation, which is a much um, higher level of consciousness, actually had higher rates of this first pattern. And so what this study comes down to in terms of patterns in the brain is the idea that if we're able to identify very specific patterns within unconscious or minimally conscious patients that can't talk to you, can't tell you what's going on, and you don't know how active their brains really are, whether there's, you know, whether there's a chance that they might come back at some point, if we can start to begin to identify patterns within the brains of these individuals that are related to higher levels of consciousness and also to higher levels of recovery, then this will give us a much better uh, standard of care for patients. One thing that comes across a lot in these um, these in brain in patients in which the brain is damaged to an extent where patients go into these vegetative or minimally conscious states, because they can't respond, you have no idea how there they are. And yeah. so you don't know whether they're hearing what you're saying when you talk to them. They don't know if you're present. You don't know if your presence is having an effect on their experience. And if we can give care to people that involves interaction and, um, and social contact, in a, in, a, in a higher cognitive way to patients who are locked in but can't just can't respond and are just stuck in their own brains but still functional, then that's going to help people a lot, mm -hmm. a lot more through these situations. It'll also help, help families kind of know, uh, you know, where their families, fam family members lie on the, on the, on the uh, level of recovery and regardless of the scale this is why i have the standing do not unplug yes, order sorry. which i re reiterate as often as i can just to make sure everybody knows it because my minimal mental state on the on the base introverted justin level is just fine by me like i'm okay with i don't actually need to interact with you i don't need to re react to the story you just told me I don't need to tell you a story for me to be perfectly okay and not and not needing to be unplugged. My interaction with you tells you nothing about yep. where I am or what I'm doing or how satisfied I am with my current existence. Keep me plugged in. Even the minimal <laughs> amount of cognitive ability that I experience is plenty. Okay. The second study that I looked at um, was another, as I said, functional magnetic resonance imaging study. This one, however, looked at the recreational hallucinogen LSD, otherwise known as acid. And different of drugs. <laughs> this this drug, uh, along with other hallucinogens, uh, people have been wondering how these drugs in, uh, interact with the brain to affect the brain's function. And uh, in, in other work, researchers uh, looking at ayahuasca and psilocybin um, suggest that psychedelic drugs may lead to disorganization of signaling within the brain. And so we don't really know that yet. And this study doesn't exactly do that. But mm. 
the this study that took place in uh, in Zurich, Switzerland, uh, got people to take LSD and stick their heads in an fMRI machine and then do pretty much nothing. Because what they wanted to do is get a baseline of how the brain works in a resting state or an normally, fMRI machine. Or, yeah, in an fMRI <laughs> machine, but a normal brain, brain resting versus uh, a, a brain that has acid in it, but resting. And so the individuals just had to lie there and have their brains, have their brains not poked and prodded. Well, I guess magnetically poked and prodded. Um, one of the ideas is that hallucinogens are, uh, get in the way of the thalamus acting as a gatekeeper for sensory information that flows into the cortex and, so when uh, you say get in the ways of, get, gets in the way of, because that it would block, it, right? Because this is the opposite almost of how it was described to me by, um, somebody who had done research in this area. Uh, which is that it actually opened it up, that it allowed right. too much. I mean, it it didn't. Uh, yes. Uh, so what I'm going to. So exactly. Oh. That's what it, it blocks the action of the thalamus. The thalamus is the brain. Is the filter. Is ah, the filter. And the thalamus okay. takes in all of our sensory information and decides which of it is going to get fed into yeah. the brain. So that the brain can act on it because the brain has its own stuff going on in there. Mm -hmm. it, but then so it does its own things. Our brain keeps itself entertained all the time and sensory information comes in and the thalamus goes, yes, no, yes, no, you get in, you don't. Prioritizes it. Yeah, it prioritizes things. Exactly. And the in the idea of what happens with these hallucinogens is that it blocks the activity of the thalamus. You know, it's like basically taking that that bouncer out of the picture so that everyone can get into the club. And so there's a flood of information, sensory information that comes in that we that normally is not processed and the brain normally doesn't have to deal with. And so that's the idea. And in order to understand this resting state, not active, but just you're lying there. What's the thalamus doing? What's the rest of the brain doing? in each of these normal versus drugged states and they uh, that's what they looked at and so uh the they were modeling the activity of the brain and in order to really get an idea of what was happening with lsd they also had a group that took lsd and a drug that binds to proteins uh in the brain and blocks serotonin receptors and so lsd uh, can bind with serotonin and dopamine receptors, multiple receptors in the brain, but this is going to block some of the neuro neurotransmitter effects and the nervous effects of LSD. And so uh, they had these three different groups and the thalamus did seem to act as this gatekeeper, but instead of finding that there was a flood of information that came into the cortex, they found that the specific regional areas in the brain became differentially activated. So right. instead of the whole brain going blah with right. the, you know, LSD in there, it was just specific regions, yeah. little, little so, bits and pieces going, Oh, okay. That's there's little, little differences around the brain. Like a fixation aspect to this. Like I, 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 I attest to this day and I've, I've already admitted to a, a having a history of experimented with this drug a very long time ago. So this is not a huge revelation to the show, but I still to this day do not believe that I would have observed or known about the existence of the baseboard trim. That's <laughs> right. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> because that's the first I time I noticed it. And I'm sure there was a part of my brain that was very active. But only around like how how many miles of this are produced? What is the purpose of this? Is this in every structure in every house everywhere? And, and so, can you take the square footage of all houses and we, can we assume then that there's a baseboard trim of about a half inch piece of wood or plastic that goes along all of them? Can it reach to the moon and back? Like it became a very specifically oriented. But there's also the thing of the visual because it's not actually and, that big of a hallucinogenic. And of if you've ever, if you've light ever... trails, which is also I've been told, because you're not limiting 
um, the observation to the that that time point, you're continuing to process the information of that light as at its different points that it passed your vision. Uh, yeah, and so the interesting thing that uh, I don't know if anyone out there has ever interacted with somebody while they are on acid, you can talk with people and have a completely normal conversation and not really know what they are internally experiencing. And I think this speaks to the idea that there is not a overall disorganization within the brain. There, that obviously some centers of the brain are still fully capable of functioning normally. Right. And are unless, not unless don't the, don't go into informational overload. Right. Unless you're the person who is on LSD, in which case there's a neon sign above your head that's flashing. Be cool, man. <laughs> don't let on. Don't blow your cover. Okay. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, human termies word <laughs> things with your mouth hole face sounds that you're making. Be cool. <laughs> You're cool. You're cool. So <laughs> these two studies I thought were really interesting that they came out, you know, they're done by completely different groups looking at different things, but using the same technique to understand patterns of activity in the brain and to really under get at this underlying mechanism of how information flows through the brain to allow for differential states of consciousness. And so these are uh, all, I, I just find this stuff fascinating um, and that we are moving forward. There's again, so much we still don't know, but we're, we're step by step getting yeah. there. I'm just shocked they were able to keep somebody on LSD in an MRI machine still. Because oh. honestly, that I mean, I don't have any personal experience with this stuff, but based on what you just told me and what I've seen in movies, that seems like based on my experience in a, a CT machine, which is kind of similar, right? There's a lot going on. There's lights, there's sounds, it's confining, it's uncomfortable, it's a little bit freaky when you're not on any drugs. Yeah. But it's also, the, the, it's not the a, fMRI. Have you have you done an fMRI? I've done an fMRI. I've no. never done. No. So the <laughs> excuse me, the MRI I'm, machine is a closed tube, and so it's very cla claustrophobic yeah. or confining. And then you have to put your head in a very you. There sometimes is a a holder for your head, and you have to keep your head still so that they can image your brain. So you're not allowed to move your head at all. And the magnet starts moving around and it makes an, when it starts going, there is this loud whacking noise. And it's whack, 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 whack. <laughs> and it's, 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 it's disturbing just on its own. And I'm, I'm trying to imagine the sensory overload that could possibly happen, tr trying to keep yourself from moving, keeping yourself in the, the confined space may be nice. Who knows? But <laughs> the noise, so this was, all of this it was together. Also, this was also yeah. the the case for a lot of of uh, governmental LSD studies, in, yeah. in True. I think the fifties, where they would put, they didn't do fMRI. No, they didn't do fMRI, but they would do these like head uh, cover things. For, for like they would do like That's a the little scientific bit of a, term. Well, okay, they would do a slight <laughs> sensory <laughs> deprivation yeah. aspect of it while you well, conversed with uh, a uh -huh. handler or psychologist type person. Um, so, and, and it's my next story to me about marijuana because I really feel like we already did, like we're already <laughs> sort of self branding by accident because I didn't know you had that story, but I did bring a marijuana story which is Go very for it. interesting. Let's let's get it's, into those the, quick. Okay. Show yeah, this this study is uh, men who have smoked marijuana at some point in their life. Uh, and there are, are a more than decent representative number of these folks in our society have significantly higher concentrations of sperm when compared to men who have never smoked marijuana, according to research by Harvard uh, Chan School Public Health Team. So. The study conducted at the fertility clinic at Massachusetts General Hospital also found that there were no significant differences in sperm concentrations between current and former marijuana speakers. Quote a voice from uh, Jorge Chavarro, associate professor of nutrition epidemiology, 
Harvard Chan School. These unexpected findings highlight how little we know about the reproductive health effects of marijuana, and in fact, of the health effects of marijuana in general. Our results need to be interpreted with caution, and they highlight the need to further study the health effects of marijuana use. This study is published uh, currently in the journal Human Reproduction. So, this is correlative. It's just a correlation. Well, no, it's self it's self reported, but here's the, okay for the study. Which the is researchers always an issue. collected uh, a thousand one hundred forty three semen samples from six hundred sixty two men between two thousand and two thousand seventeen. On average, these men were thirty six years old, white college educated men. So here's here's the thing though. For most of that time of the study, marijuana was illegal, right? Mm -hmm. What if this has nothing to do with marijuana whatsoever? Right. What if, self-reporting, what if, huh? What, yes. What if higher semen concentrations are correlative to honesty? Yeah. <laughs> Men. What if that's the thing, right? And, and then, you know, <laughs> then... Then we have a whole completely different study that now needs to be done now that it's legal because now the self-reporting, because at this point they said they suspected that 16% of men have used marijuana. No. What? That number is no. that number is grossly underreported. That's way off. The number is much higher. It's not a hundred percent. No. But it's closer to a hundred percent than it is 16%. Yeah, I'd say it's over far. 50 for sure. Yeah. So so, but, but so here in this, California, probably 90. Yeah, maybe <laughs> California is a special, but this is New Hampshire. I mean, that can't be that different. Yeah. yeah. But so, so this is what I'm suspecting the correlative is honesty is correlated with higher sperm counts. <laughs> That's all I took away from this. Has nothing to do with the marijuana. Interesting. Uh, but yeah, more research will probably suss that one out. The only way you can find out if marijuana actually affects sperm count, count is to take somebody who's never smoked before, take a sample, yeah. have them smoke, take mm -hmm. a sample. That's the only um, way to find out if that's, but they probably couldn't do it then because marijuana was illegal. So it was this whole extra um, level of, of clearances to ask somebody <clears throat> to use a controlled substance, blah, 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 right. blah. But now this is something that could be done now. So, so what's also interesting in this was that uh, in this same study, the, they found that those with greater use of marijuana were associated with higher serum testosterone levels out of that. They did uh, some 300 and something uh, blood tests as well. That's interesting. Uh, yeah. So, you know, I mean, and I, I guess I guess it also just builds on that we're learning that the cannabinoids uh in these things do affect a lot of things within the human biology separate from it being a drug or the, the or, you know or it's the other way around which is that higher testosterone levels lead to yes. lead to risk taking which we do yes. that is true yeah. um so more risk taking i.e smoking marijuana and or or more succumbing to peer pressure or, or a like, higher tolerance to the drugs. So yeah. therefore you require yeah. to take more to get yeah. the same effect. There's an yeah. And there's testosterone is also going to be tied in with semen count. So it yeah. Is, yeah. So there's a whole lot of correlatives within the correlate correlation of this correlative, but uh, I still like mine the best. Yeah. <laughs> There's no thing about a whole bunch of correlatives. You there you go. The ones you like. Hey, Kiki. Speaking of hallucinogens, oh, do you want to hear know. about pink squirrels? Well, yeah. man, you just blew my mind. Oh, I, you I know, are. I was thinking about pink squirrels right yeah. at that moment. I was totally picturing a pink squirrel, and then there you were like, "I see pink squirrel." Or did you say it after I thought about it? I can't really tell now. Texas A&M University <laughs> Department of Wildlife and Fisheries in College Station look, was looking at a forest survey with ultraviolet flashlights, looking at lichens, mosses, and plants to see what had fluoresced. And in a fluke accident, a flying squirrel was near a bird feeder. The flashlight passed over. And in the ultraviolet light, this flying squirrel was hot pink what? with with access to a museum collection at minnesota science museum 
They then took the same ultraviolet light and looked at different types of squirrels. They looked at stuffed flying squirrels that had collected over time. Every single flying squirrel in the collection fluoresced hot pink in some intestine in test in intensity it's the end of the show of uv light um they tested all three of the north american flying squirrel species the northern flying squirrel the southern flying squirrel and the humboldt's flying squirrel did you know there are three flying squirrel species in the united states i did, did not. not now no now i know all three of them fluoresced after they compared them to other squirrels like the american red squirrel and gray squirrels they did not so now the question is, why was the flying squirrel pink? It's not the setup to a joke, but we still don't know the answer. So far, the hypotheses are for communication or camouflage. Um, how that plays in, we're not so sure. It could have to do with mate choice. It could actually be um, a, a coloration that is some sort of warning signal. But the, the ultraviolet spectrum, the ultraviolet spectrum is crazy. So it actually could be camouflage if you're thinking about ultraviolet. If there's lichens that live in the same area that fluoresce pink, mm -hmm. it could be good camouflage. We don't know. So this much, 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 much further study is required. But for now, we can say with certainty that North American flying squirrels fluoresce hot pink. And I guess the question now would be, do all those squirrels live in similar habitats? Because if they're all hot pink, is it just because they were re they're related and it came from one and they've all kept it? Or is it that, like you said, it is camouflage and they're tying in with lichens? But it just it's hard to think that all of the northern squirrel, the southern flag squirrel, the Humboldt squirrel, they're yeah. all going to be... Camouflage yeah, that's in that interesting. Case. It looks oh. like they they don't Seems over widespread. They do overlap a little bit, not by much. Um, the northern flying squirrel is way up into Canada, so it's a pretty different habitat. Yeah, totally different. I I don't know, man. This is this is one pink to be studied squirrels. for later. Why pink. why you pink squirrel? Pink squirrels. <sighs> Oh my goodness. And in, as we come to the very end of the show, I want you all to know that all those times in college, you wished that you could, you know, fall asleep on your textbook and have it help you learn. Mm -hmm. well, no, it doesn't, yeah, it doesn't work exactly like that. But a new study just came out in which researchers published in Current Biology, a study in which they got people into deep sleep states which is very when the we're not in the REM cycles you're in the deep sleep and they played German words paired with their English counterparts to these individuals who had never learned German before and never heard really heard German before and these translations were played over and over again to the sleeping people when the people woke up they were more likely to somewhat recognize the words that they heard. So, and it also determined, uh, depended on a particular state of the hippo, the cells in the hippocampus of the brain. They call this state the upstate. It's an active state in which, um, in which the cells are actually doing work. They're downstate. They're not active. They're not doing work. And the states alternate every half second. So up, down, up, down, up, down, up, down. And when these words were played during upstates, it helped with that learning. And so when the hmm. sleeping person woke up and heard, the sleeping person word the, heard these word pairs like Topher, Key, Guga, Elephant, huh. and then they were more likely to categorize Topher as something small and Guga as something large. So there is something to be said for learning while you sleep. I maybe, like it. Yeah, maybe if you do play those recordings of lectures to yourself while you sleep, something will get in there. I wonder sleep. if there's something to that uh, whole kind of like self-help craze of sleep therapy, um, playing motivational mm -hmm. tapes while you sleep, stuff like that. This might be why it works or it's it... Right. If it works, I don't know. Or Google the science sounds behind like, it. 
or Guga is it's just, just the way the word similar sounds. To Giga, which is yeah. a gigabyte or a gigawatt, which is a big thing. There were other God. words. Yeah, there I feel like words. so. Ger German is English. American is English is a Germanic language, right? So, mm -hmm. like, so there is weirdo links there. But I'm sure. Did they just do German, or did they do other languages? I'm sure they did other ones, right? I think I I think they only did German, and that's okay. in this particular. So study. maybe that's the next step is to pick a language that is not related to English in any way, <laughs> like <laughs> Arabic or something. And see exactly. What happens. And my final story for the night: we have a use for all those discarded fidget spinners <gasps> that are <laughs> around your houses. Now that the fidget spinner craze is over, what do you do with all those fidget spinners? Oh well. Maybe you can use them as a blood plasma separator. What? <laughs> exactly. That was finally my something to do with all that blood I have lying around. Oh, wait, it's the <laughs> fidget spinners. Sorry. <laughs> yeah. Researchers wanted to know if they worry could use you. fidget no, spinners. <laughs> if they could use fidget spinners as a hand powered electricity free centrifuge platform. And it works. It takes about four to seven minutes to separate blood plasma um, and to so for areas really where cool. where centrifuges are hard to come by and you need to separate your blood or in the case of, I don't know, an electrical outage, <laughs> get those fidget spinners, keep that blood spinning. And uh, and yes, fidget spinners for the scientific win. Wow. That's pretty cool. Actually, that might be helpful like out in the field and stuff. Yeah, absolutely. Like if you're doing blood samples in the field, taking yeah. small, like in this case, I think they had little capillary tubes that they taped to the fidget spinners. And you could uh, in the field, if you're doing animal blood samples, bird mm -hmm. sam blood samples, uh, just do your sampling and your separation right in the field. So That's wildlife really cool. biologists out there. Yeah. Yeah, maybe we your fidget spinners <laughs> can be used, or you know the, the the discarded fidget spinners from your seven year old nephew. That's what's gonna work. All right, or the yeah. ones that I've confiscated from teenagers. Oh wait, sorry. Mm -hmm. <laughs> exactly. Have you been stealing toys from children? Confiscating. Oh. There's a difference. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All this and more on the next episode of This Week in Science. We will discuss the dip. No, we won't. But no. we have come to the end of this episode of This Week in Science. Thank you, everyone, for watching. I want to say thank you to Fada for your help with show notes and with social media and with the YouTube descriptions and helping with the chat room there. Gord McLeod, thank you for helping with our chat room, making sure it flows nicely. Everyone is in there. Everyone's nice in there, right? In our chat room. Identity4, thank you for recording the show so that we can have the audio version as a podcast. And everyone who does support us, thank you for your support. I would like to take this moment to thank our Patreon sponsors. Thank you to Paul Disney, Richard Onimus, Ed Dyer, Stu Pollock, Philip Shane, Ken Hayes, Harrison Prather, Charlene Henry, Joshua Fury, Steve DeBell, Alex Wilson, Tony Steele, Craig Landon, Mark Mazaros, Jack Matthew Litwin, Jason Roberts, Bill K. Bob Calder, Time Jumper 319, Eric Knapp, Richard, Brian Condren, Dave Neighbor, Aiden Jeff, John Ratnaswamy, Dave Friedel, Daryl Myshak, Andrew Swanson, Paul Ronovich, Corinne Benton, Sue Doster, Dave Wilkinson, Ben Bignell, Richard Porter, Noodles, Kevin Reardon, Christoph Zuknarek, Ashish Pants, Ulysses Adkins, Sarah Chavis, RTM, Rick Ramis, Paul, John McKee, Jason Olds, Brian Carrington, Christopher Dreyer, Lisa Slazuski, Jim Trapeau, Greg Riley, Sean Lamb, Ben Rothick, Steve, Le Steve Leesman, Kurt Larson, Rudy Garcia, Marjorie Gary S., Robert Greg Briggs, Brendan Minish, Christopher Rappin, Flying Out, Aaron Luthen, Matt Sutter, Mark Hessen, Flo, Kevin Parachan, Byron Lee, and EO. Thank you for all your support on Patreon. And if you are interested in finding out how you can support us, you can find information at twist.org. You can also tell your friends about twists and twist.org on next week's show i'm working on an interview but i don't have it specified yet i've got a couple people bouncing around so we will have an interview on next week's show nice 
Yeah. And once again, we'll be broadcasting live online at 8 p.m. Pacific time at twist.org slash live. So if you can watch live, you can also join our chat room. But if you can't make it, don't worry. Everything is archived. You can get the podcast. If you subscribe, you can also find episodes at twist.org and on YouTube. Thank you for enjoying the show. Twist, as mentioned, is also available as a podcast. Just Google This Week in Science in your iTunes directory. Or if you have one of the new mobile-type devices, you can look for Twist, the number four Droid app in the Android Marketplace, or simply This Week in Science and anything Apple Market plays it. For more information on anything you've heard here today, show notes are available on our website. That's at www.twist.org, where you can also make comments and start conversations with the hosts or other listeners. Or you can contact us directly. Email Kirsten at Kirsten at thisweekinscience.com, Justin at twistminion at gmail.com, or Blair at blairbaz at twist.org. Just be sure to put twist, T-W-I-S, somewhere in your subject line. Otherwise, your email may be spam filtered into oblivion. <laughs> you can also hit us up on the Twitter, where we are at Twist Science, at Dr. Kiki, at Jackson Fly, and at Blair's Menagerie. We love your feedback. If there's a topic you would like us to cover or address, a suggestion for an interview, a haiku that comes to you in the night, please let us know. <gasps> We'll be back here next week, and we hope you'll join us again for more great science news. Yes, and if you've learned anything from this show, please remember, it's all in your head. This Week in Science. This Week in Science. This Week in Science. This week in science, it's the end of the world. So I'm setting up shop, got my banner unfurled. It says the scientist is in, I'm gonna sell my advice. Show them how to stop the robot with a simple device. I'll reverse global warming with a wave of my hand. And all it'll cost you is a couple of grand. This week's science is coming your way. So everybody listen to what I say. I use the scientific method for all that it's worth. And I'll broadcast my opinion all over the earth. Because it's this week in science. This week in science. 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 This week in science. This week in science. 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 I've got one disclaimer and it shouldn't be news. That what I say may not represent your views. But I've done the calculations and I've got a plan. If you listen to the science, you may just get understand. But we're not trying to threaten your philosophy. We're just trying to say the world from Jeopardy. Jeopardy and this week in science is coming away so everybody listen to everything we say and if you use our methods instead of rolling a die we may rid the world of toxoplasma got the eye because it's this week in science this week in science this week in science, science, science. This week in science. This week in science, science, science. I've got a laundry list of items I want to address. From stopping global hunger to dredging Loch Ness. I'm trying to promote more rational thought. And I'll try to answer any question you've got. So how can I ever see the changes I seek when I can only set up shop one hour a week? This week in science is coming your way. You better just listen to what we say. And if you learn anything from the words that we said, then please just remember it's all in your head.
Cause it's this week in science. This week in science. This week in science. 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 This week in science. This week in science. 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 This week in 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 science. That is the end of the show, everyone. It's the end of the show. We did it. We did it. We did it. We did it. All of the science. All of the science. It was good. I have some calendars left. You can click on that link, Twist 2019, and buy a calendar. You can also click on subscribe. You can also buy things on Zazzle or Patreon. Woohoo! Also, Patreon supporters at certain levels can get one of these original pieces signed, sent to you. Yeah, the originals. That's the, the originals. exciting thing. And Justin last night sent me some um, uh, some recordings, some recordings of an MP3 for a voicemail that I'm going to be sending Ooh, out fun. to a few people who are within the patreon support level that gets a voicemail message it says disclaimer 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 and then it goes on to say some other things Ooh. yeah it's pretty funny it's that good fun. mm -hmm. so we've got some uh, some voicemail a um, voicemail message to send out to some people some new original artwork which is very exciting um i have a question kiki yes I've been trying to assemble cal uh, coloring book items. Cool. But I don't know how to put them together. Like what, what format it would need to be in. Like if I just, if I just gave you a PDF that's like 60 pages long, is that oh, what right. you want? Or mm. does it need to be in a particular format? And then, like, if it's a PDF, like, what does the DPI need to be for it to look good as a book? Mm -hmm. Like, these are the these are the things I don't know. Adult coloring book. <sighs> what? what? Why are we talking about adult coloring books? Stop Publish. it. Both of you, stop it right now. Why? What are you talking no. about? I made a whole calendar of them, dude. Oh, yeah. No, that was awesome. I thought that was just because you were colorblind, though. I didn't really. No, I thought it'd be fun. That it was at that intent. Yeah. That would be a fun uh, thing. Hold on. Let me see if I can find. Uh, let's see. I will look for that information for you. Okay. Great. Uh, yeah. I will look for that. And, and then I'll start out. slapping stuff together. Yeah. And then. Um, oh, I had an email from Tom Merritt over at Daily Tech News Show. And he was wondering if we wanted to do a trade. <laughs> Intriguing. Collaboration? <laughs> <laughs> yes, collaboration and a trade. So I'm guessing they want Blair. <laughs> he said Blair and Justin. Oh, and okay. Me. And he was saying um, that like every, I don't know the details for show, but the idea would be that like three times a year on both shows, we would like trade, <sighs> some, ho trade some hosts around. I love it. Yeah. which could be super a little host fun. swapping i didn't know you two were down yeah i brought this up a long right. time ago throw a bunch host of podcast swapping. keys in a bowl <laughs> <laughs> bunch of microphones maybe is that what who's it would gonna, be who's coming home with twist tonight uh, that right. sounds very exciting yeah wait, right, right, but wait i missed it because i didn't start listening until uh part way into what you were saying 
What, what's, what's the other podcast? It's called the Daily Tech News Show. Okay. It's fun. I've been on it uh, a few times and usually they do like it's a bunch of tech headlines and then um, they'll have like one. It's in it's a kind of half hour long show. It's about an hour, maybe kind of time commitment. It's usually mid afternoon that they record. So I don't know how easy that'll be for either of you. Um, if it's only a couple times a year, that's it's not yeah. too hard. As long as yeah. I can, I, as long as it's, I get advanced notice, it's not no, it's, a big it's, deal it's at all. It's right now. Go. No, Blair, no. If it's like, yes. hey, can you do it this week, Thursday? That's hard. But if you're like, yeah. hey, next month, like, oh yeah, I can figure that out. Yeah. And so it would be kind of split up. So like, you know, one episode, you, you Blair would go on and maybe uh -huh. talk something, you know, they, and we will figure out Tom and I will kind of, you know, we'll figure out with you guys what you think would be good good to talk about on the show. Um, and then you'll usually they get into some kind of they'll have like a in depth conversation kind of that's usually about ten minutes long, maybe much shorter than the kinds of conversations we usually have here yeah. on this show. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, so, yeah, and so then I'm the other way around, that. we that's would get Sarah, like Roger, fun. or Tom. Yeah, yeah. it'd be yeah, fun, right? Like fun. Yeah, I love it. That's great. Yeah, host swapping. That's right. <laughs> oh, <yeah. laughs> Ed from Connecticut. So yes, Sarah Lane is asking. Ed is asking who are the other hosts on DTNS. Uh, Tom is the main host. There's also Sarah Lane, Roger Chang, um, and yeah, he's the producer, sometime commentator. But he he's he's good commentator. He's he's got some good interests and good knowledge. Roger's great to talk to. Uh, yeah. Yeah, it would be fun. I think it'd be fun. I'm glad you guys are into it. So I will um, I will get back to Tom and we'll figure out what we're going to do and how we're going to do and, and what we think. Yeah. Which would be great. That's great. Yeah. That's fun. Awesome. Okay. I will get back about that. Is there anything else that I needed to talk about for the twist business side of things? Um, we were trying to figure out how to set up an interface for people to sign up for an, for the newsletter. <gasps> yeah. Is Aaron Lore in the chat room tonight? I didn't see him. But yeah, there's uh, HTML he, in he there. I do that. And I also yeah. need some I need some help because I got a hacker in there again that I gotta <gasps> get out. Oh no. Someone oh, no. needs some I I don't know if they're getting in through the WordPress or getting in through our main server, but uh, what's what's been affected? If you look for twists on Google, you'll see that some of the responses want to send you to Viagra. Oh. oh no! Yeah, stuff okay. that should. That might be my fault. I've been doing a lot of Google searching lately. <laughs> um, yeah. Sorry. Or in Firefox, I don't know. Yeah. Have you searched for twist.org? I don't know. I I searched recently and was like, mm -hmm. oh. No, I know, I know. I want to search. Oh, Levitra. <sighs> yes. There you I go. see it. So it's under the main header. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yes. Wow. Like subheading or I something. It doesn't sneaky. show up in mine. It's super sneaky. I know. I know. Uh, super sneaky. I got to get yeah, in there and it, cut it, out. It the claims to be twist.org slash live. Yeah, yeah, it's got a. Yeah, that's weird. There's a weird biker online tag to us. Well, you know, as long as we're getting paid. Are we getting paid? No. <laughs> All right, we get rid of this. Um, it's my WordPress. Thanks, Bleak. Okay, WordPress is easy to oh. fix. I can get I can get people out. I, I think we should announce this. Maybe it's, it's like maybe this is premature. Amazing. Maybe it's too soon to announce. What? But after, have you announced think, it to us yet? Uh, no, you announced it. Well, you that this was a a direct order uh, from you. Um, the 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 Justin Jackson disclaimery bit yes for the Patreon thing which has been promised for I think 10 years a little while finally now. got made <laughs> so 
if you want and it is it is we might actually have to speed it up uh because i've i've on playing it back i realized it's quite long for yeah. a voicemail message it may need to go double time but it has been recorded and i am very proud to state that this voicemail covers all bases of what you would want a voicemail to cover from an from an unknown caller at least covers all the bases yes But this is, I don't know how long we've been. I feel like it's been at least five years. <laughs> well, we have, been, I don't think we've been on Patreon for five years. I feel like we've been on it for a little while. Yeah, it's been five years. It's, I think this yeah. has been a Patreon sponsor level for five years. But just, just to be fair, it took this long to craft the perfect voicemail uh, outgoing message. There you go. So I think we started our Patreon right before Kiki moved. Because I remember. Yeah, 2015. So it's been, what, three, four years. Yeah. So I remember I going to your house when, when you still lived here and uh, helping you package up all the Patreon perks because, like, it was new. So you had to hit all the people at once kind of with their T-shirts and their stickers and their their arts. And we did it all in your in your little office yeah but this isn't it i mean the how long have we been been reading the names i feel like that's longer than 2015 but i don't i can't tell time. i don't know i have to go back and see yeah go back and see should i get premium support with word fence would that help my wordpress no idea what words you're talking about right now. <laughs> WordFence is a security plugin for WordPress that uh, oh. that I don't have premium right now, but right. maybe you, if I got you know premium. Well, considering this has happened twice, work. maybe. Do you know why it's part of the premium <laughs> key? Because they left <laughs> gapping holes in their security right. <laughs> until you pay them. This is exactly, this is how this works. I know. Otherwise, it would just be the service that they provide to begin with. Oh, Bleak is sending me links. Blogging wizard. Okay, what's that? Site link. Uh, what do they look like? Okay. I don't, it'll tell me about it and how to fix it. I have to figure it out. I don't know. I'm not going to stay up and do it tonight, but yeah. I'll try and fix things. I gotta, that means I have to get into, it's the Google site links. Yeah, I think I have to get into my server. I don't think it's WordPress. I think, yeah, I think it's, he's in my code. He's in my code, man. God, that sucks. Why do you assume it's a he, Kiki? Could be a she, that's right. <laughs> Well, it it's could kind be of a like she the, trying to sell erection pills, I guess. It's this is listen, I grew up in a day and an age when you refer to the unknown person as a he. I know, I get in or, trouble with this still. Or too. They. Now it's like you I, mean, I know look, this it's just the way that grammar works. <laughs> it's the two things that are getting me in trouble now are you guys. Hey guys, okay, guys. People don't like that anymore. But the other one is dude. I, and I refuse to relinquish my use of dude. And you so, know what? So you know what? I, I'm all I yes, people can be as sensitive to, as they want about what you know, you know, I think I'm old enough where I can say I don't care. I'm gonna say, <laughs> hey guys, and I'm gonna say dude, because it has nothing to do with you sensitive people who I I I'm I but words do mean Sorry. things, and 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 I catch I catch myself because I t I, I cover a lot of uh, human origin stories on the show, and I have like I like I hit upon Ancient mankind, man. yeah, and I go ah, is my only time telling half the story if I talk about mankind? 
And the other one that I've, I've been like, it's, playing and then with it's human, and then it's humankind. But can you say human right. because human right. has the, the word, word man, man in it? Oh, it's a rabbit hole. But it's humans. But then okay, but well, man is also part of the. But then I, I like the other thing I is instead of saying modern humans, I've been actively trying to convert my language to saying current humans. Oh, uh. <laughs> right. That's funny. So you're because, not offending because, the Neanderthals that are hanging out? No, not it's right. not even the Neanderthals. It's the future humans who are gonna be like, uh, okay, you're the modern humans because that work that whole then it's next generation modern humans. Like you yeah. keep having to add extra words to it. So then it's like I, I've been trying to like uh use current humans to describe the people like of it. today versus yeah, modern because it's always been modern going back all the way. Neanderthals yeah. were modern hominids, right? It, it, there was a point when, when, when everything was the modern version of whatever. So modern really is a temporal, meaningless word. So you just say current uh, to talk about your current time frame. Anyway, yeah, I mean, slang term, slang terms change from generation to generation, and I grew up with excuse me, grandparents who, you know, used insensitive yeah. racial terminology. Um, and that changed. And in my, gen, you know, growing up, I was like, oh, can't believe you said that. Wow, <laughs> grandma. All right. You know, and now I'm, you know, now I'm hitting a stage when racial and gender sensitivity is something that's very high. And it's, it is important mm -hmm. to pay attention and be clear about stuff. Um, and yeah, I've, I fully support everybody having access to uh, language, to information, to society, and to not be, to not feel like they are being shut out because of certain language. Um, there's there's comfortable there is, transition. There's uncomfortable yeah. transition. There's yeah. necessary transition, and there's nice to have transition. And I feel like those are all very different things. Like. You might have been frustrated with grandma that didn't know how to work the VCR, but that's us now who don't know how to write code and run something through our very own <laughs> Raspberry Pi, right? That's right? Like that's the mm -hmm. next generation's version that is like, God, you can't even write HTML, whatever, right? <laughs> so it's like, just like that, there's, and we're moving in the right direction, which I think is ultimately what's important, right? We're moving in the right yeah. direction towards equality and sensitivity, but there's going to be some bumps when yeah. you've grown up using a certain lexicon and there are some things that are necessary to remove which which is you know like using mental disability as a diss or using sexual orientation as a diss those are things that happened i mm -hmm. know in my childhood that totally. i have recognized is entirely not okay yep. and is completely out of my vocabulary with good mm -hmm. reason but there are other things that are harder to replace and might not be as necessary and saying dude uh, might is, be one of those <laughs> uh yeah yeah and i just isn't like doesn't dude actually mean elephant butt hair does it? <laughs> what are you talking about? Get out of it. <laughs> no. Is that like dork? Like... <laughs> okay. I swear. I think that. Wait, hold on. According to Google, dude is also a verb, which means to dress up elaborately. My brother was all duded yeah, up, up in right. silver and burgundy. Is the is that duded? No, no, that's dudded. Oh no, it's d u d e. No, but it's uh, like you put your duds on. You get uh, all dudded up. But it says dude, no, no. and it's uh, and it's shortened it from doodle. Urban Dictionary says yes, dude, a word Americans use to address each other, particularly stoners, surfers, and skaters. Dude is what you call someone when you aren't sure about their name. It's what you call your best friend, too. <laughs> it's another name for homie or friend. Dude. Originally, dude meant a stuck-up person who dressed dude. overly well. Total. Dude. It emerged in the year 1883. Later, it was used in the Old West to mean a city person who moved to the West without actually know knowing what oh, he was yeah. doing. A dude ranch. A uh, dude, dude ranch. ranch. He's got Synonymous. the fencing on the wrong side of the post. You can tell yep. a dude right away. 
Yeah. Uh, Later in California, the term changed from these insults to a term meaning any male, human or otherwise, and sometimes is used to reference tom girls and emphasis as well. She's a total dude. Yeah. It's uh, otherwise known as the universal pronoun. Here it is. An aggravated hair on an elephant's butt. (laughs) Wait, what's an aggr? What is an aggravated hair? Like, like, the- like infected or ingrown or something. Oh. <laughs> so the this is aggr- saying. Yes. So I here's the the weird thing. See words, man. See, I'm saying mm, man now, man? and man, I'm not mean. Okay, but anyway, Good man. She's talking to me. Is what she's. So saying. the so. The, I just yes. saw something that said that dude came from the English word doodle. And that's where it originally came from. But there is also a Bangladeshi word, dude, that is related to a hair on an elephant. Yeah, I don't think that's the one that spread really no. far and wide. Somehow. Stop. Please stop listening. <laughs> what? What? Uh... Yeah. etymology it is a thing absolutely words words go from meaning one thing to another thing yes i like dude i like dude what about i want to know the etymology of guys you guys it's a man uh-huh. it's a british figure uh, representing guy fox oh mm. Um, and as a verb, it means to make fun of or ridicule. He didn't realize I was guying the whole idea. What? Yeah, that's not used. <laughs> yeah. Oh, boy. Yeah, so let's see. Definition from Merriam-Webster. Man, fellow, person. Used in plural to refer to members of a group regardless of sex. Individual creature, as in the other dogs pale in comparison to this little guy. Often capitalized, Guy Fox, chiefly British, a person of grotesque appearance. Huh? Yeah. yeah, okay. So so you know that you know the word that I like the best, and it's also it also implies a good naturedness about a people. Uh, a generalized term. Mm-hmm. Folks. Folks, Folks is folks. non-gender. And yeah. you don't say like, you know. <laughs> Hey, Those folks. Nazi folks <laughs> went about trying to conquer it. folks. You can't use as a derogatory. Folks is always like the good people. Folks is always the good people, and it's non-gender specific. So if you want to say nice about something about yeah. a group of people, call them folks. Yeah. Folks the other nice. thing they always say is you can say y'all, but I don't want to say y'all. Eh, you all, yeah. you all. So the first known use of guy was in 1806 in reference to get this studying or reinforcing with a guy. What a rope, the guy? a rope, chain, rod, or wire that's attached to something mm. huh. as a wire, as a brace, or a guide. Oh, guide. A guide. A guy. A guide. A yep. A brace. Interesting. Yep. Oh, there you go. So it's yes, etymology, everyone. Yeah. I can still say guy, guys, dude, dudes. Uh, that's fine. <laughs> it's fine. Growly Bear, thank you for that. Thank you for saying that. What? Uh, uh, that if I need WordPress help. <laughs> so, oh, that's good. <laughs> that's great. Oh, that's good. Yeah. I always forget to open the YouTube chat room. Yeah, and noodles. If I use bro, it's gonna be bra. Bra. Hey, what? What? What bra. up? Bra. 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 What up? Bra. I don't. Bra. Brohim. Bro. <laughs> oh, I like buddy too, Ozzy Bogan Tech. Buddy. I don't hey, like buddy. buddy. Hey, buddy. 
What that's movie was that? Was that Brendan Fraser? That's Polly Shore. And he Pauly goes, Shore. Shore. Everyone Buddy. He Buddy. ruined it for everyone forever, always. <laughs> yeah. Hey, brah. Do you even lift? Did I do that right? Yeah. That was <laughs> I think you did. You have to pop your collar first, though. That's right. Hey, buddy. Hey. <laughs> 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 oh my goodness i try to be sensitive i do i really do want to be sensitive there are some things i'm going to have a hard time giving up mm -hmm. and i really have to learn the reasons really 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 that i can't yeah, it's, it's you could and like you could take it uh to um Extremes. I, th I don't know if I talked about this. On everything the show, can be taken to but, extremes. But uh, jaywalking, you mm. know what that is, right? Yeah, it's against the law. It's against. It's a crime because yeah. you're crossing the street in a, in a way that you're not supposed to that interferes with vehicles. Well, yeah. it turns out that the word J meant hillbilly, mm -hmm. and oh. the fact that you were walking the street, which is used to be all all pedestrian right away wherever you were mm -hmm. and at some point was replaced by all vehicle right of way wherever they are being a jaywalker meant you were walking like a hillbilly oh my and it gosh. was a uh, derogatory term that's very interesting uh, and yet it's actually so i've always like i've always imagined like someday i'm going to get a, a, a ticket and they're going to say jaywalking i'm going to be like how dare you and of course the officer won't get it uh, okay, but I'm going to go to court and I'll be like, I was me. charged with a racial epitaph attached to the, like, but because nobody knows that that's like racially or societally charged, it won't have any no. bank. So it, it does have to be one of these uh, meaningless words that has been used uh, in current enough history against I have people meaning. for yeah. it to have meaning. Yeah. Yep. I mean, it's, oh, it's, language and culture. It's all mixed up and tied uh, together. It's all tied up into our cognition, mm -hmm. how we think things. We are ourselves an extension of the world we live in. And uh, speaking of which, this is the thing that keeps reoccurring, which is people talk about ethnicity as though that can apply to any peoples anywhere. Whereas my actual heritage of family goes back to the people on the island of Ethnos, the actual ethnic people. We were an actual people. We were the ethnic people. And now people talk really? about eth being ethnic or eth ethnicity as if it's a general term for... for uh, Where's uh, Ethnos? It's kind of uh, west north of Greece, smaller island. Huh. And and Crete. Um, it's a very subject, but we we were traveling people because the island was small. It didn't you couldn't have a very large population, so our people traveled a lot. And then when they saw somebody who was not from your neck of the islands, you would say, "Ah, oh, there's an ethnic person," because that's very logically what they would assume. But the thing that like this is like the first meme. It like grew into like all people of a foreign place are ethnic people right but, but no there's an actual ethnic people and the fact that ethnic or eth is is used as a general term is so offensive to the actual i think there's like still like 300 and something people living it's a tiny island living on the people <laughs> on the island of ethnos who are really pissed about it and then their relatives who all had to move are like yeah well we get it it's <laughs> not really <laughs> but but still you, you never know how in which way the language and the and, and the origin of the language was at some point normal and at some other point later uh derogatory so it's, it can be difficult fascinating yeah but i also like I like and then this is also like the thing that we should probably have cut the show right before i got into but it's the 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 nuance and layers and levels of gender that are currently 
available and uh like i feel guilty not having learned all of them on the one hand and also on the other hand don't care <laughs> and i don't care because not because i don't care that that they can have a group that they represent and and own but it, but you just it doesn't matter to you about no like it I, like, like it shouldn't be i also feel like that's not how like your your like i mean like the, the other side of this is because that's just a sex thing. So who cares? Like, I don't feel like I need to go out and define myself as a list of specific sexual fetishes or preferences. And a li like, that's not, that shouldn't be identity. Well, one. part, part of it is, it isn't just that it's about, um, it's it's not all related to sex. A lot of it has to do with their own personal identity. Right. Mm -hmm. And so I think that more of it's about just getting the idea that it's not binary. It's not one or the other, right? right, and, right, right, right but right. but the more the more str like striations there are, right. the more complex it gets, the more I think and you know, I can't speak for any group of people in particular, but I, I, I bet a lot of them would just be happy if assumptions weren't being made and that they were allowed to call themselves whatever they wanted. Yeah. And, and yep. I don't have a problem with anybody calling themselves what they want, but it, it becomes very like if somebody says uh, that guy and I went, whoa, whoa, whoa. You also have to throw in that extroverted existentialist atheistic guy like like you're you're pulling in from categories aside from general and that's it's too much to expect uh, i think other people to fulfill all of your identity uh qualifications for yourself when they respond or, or converse with you or interact with you and i think i mean and it's and it's like how we started this whole conversation you guys could mean anybody yeah dude could mean everyone like yeah. there, there's to try to pull people away from all the generalities because i'm like ah you know what folks you know some days i'm a folk someday i'm not a folk someday i'm a <laughs> piece and you've picked the wrong day to call me folk because i'm not there's a part where your your ask of other people's acceptance not acceptance but um adherence to your self-definition is asking more out of a society than is possible. I think ultimately what I will aim to do as a human is um, make adjustments where I think that they are appropriate. Mm -hmm. And then other than that, um, make adjustments when people ask me to for their specific case. Right. Yes. That's and, the and thing exactly. that I really yeah. try to focus on. It's like if, if, if something is a trigger for them, yeah. if they've struggled for much of their life with their gender identity and they don't want to be called a guy, worse. then yeah. I will not call that person dude hey, guy, or guy. Dude. Or no, if or I have man, a friend who wants to be called a Klingon, I'm totally down with yeah. that. But 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 don't get upset if I didn't recognize you were a Klingon. Before from I knew 20 parsecs yeah. away. Like yeah. that's not going to happen. Right. Well, I guess if I was already in parsecs, I might be close yeah. to having it. And I'm I think that's there. ultimately what it's about is just allowing for the um the social construct of being asked to not be called a thing without making it a big deal. Except again, mm -hmm. I'm also like speaking as a Californian where we like accept that all these things are realities and, and a lot of the people struggling with this are not right. in a comfortable California-ish. Yeah, you know? I mean, I, I, I exchange first, and then second. Like, I exchange emails with lots of people who in their email signature put their preferred pronouns. Okay. Which is like becoming a thing, which is it's very a, it cool. Is a thing. You go to a conference and people put it on their their badges. Yeah. You have it on your you have it in your email signatures. You have it on your website. You have it in your Twitter uh, profile, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. So that you know, but that's I think that is helpful because then it lets people know. If, yeah. You know, oh yeah. What the preference is, so that when you do when you are twenty parsecs away, mm -hmm. you're like, oh wait, I remember this person. Okay, I know. I know what I know what to do here. I know how to I know how to how to refer to someone. 
That yeah. So I think, I think that's, that's the, that's at the heart of this is allowing for people to ask for adjustments, but also allowing for people that don't have any bad intentions to adjust, which I think is the kind of like the two sides to this. Right. Yeah. So like I, it's the only way that, that kind of this can progress in a, in a, in a productive way, I think there has to be allowances for missteps, right? Mm -hmm. Which is why, I, I mean, and everyone who I have spoken to, who I have, for example, used a pronoun that is not the pronoun that they desire, have been so gracious and and it's been, just been like a very simple thing and it's just been like, ooh, yeah, no, I, I go by, you know, him, he. I'm just like, oh, okay, cool, moving on. Like, mm -hmm. not a big deal, but... Yeah. um. I, I think there there is kind of this like it becomes this fear of like oh no the floor is made of glass <laughs> it's like no there needs to be a conversation to be able to move forward. But isn't it also on the other hand kind of awesome that uh, a lot of people got to turn the floor to glass? Oh, absolutely. I mean, that's, that's awesome. Yeah. Like the other side of that is too like ah, good on you. Yeah. <laughs> I'm so glad you turned it like. Now I'm like awkwardly don't know what to say, but kind of can appreciate that the the floor was turned to glass because we've turned that corner. So yeah, yeah cause it cause the whole world was made of glass for them before. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Absolutely. I got I gotta roll. So I'm gonna uh, um say say good night, Blair. Good night, Blair. Say good night, Justin. Good night, Justin. <gasps> good night. Good night, Kiki. Kiki. Good night, everyone. Thank you for watching again. And I think the evolution of the language that we use as our culture shifts is going to be so fascinating to watch as well. And uh, next week, join us again. I will be here this Friday for my, not here. I will be on my Twitch channel this Friday at 1 p.m. Pacific time for my Twitch conversational science stream and uh, other than that we'll be back next Wednesday here right all of us will be here and there will be an interview I'll have details it's the twist that. love fest next week also it is next week is Valentine's Day so get get let's get our love science on how much do we love science I'm really crossing my fingers for some invertebrate sex Right? Come on, scientific community. <laughs> Throw it at me. Come on. Let's make Blair's Animal Corner shine. That's right. Um, yeah. So we'll talk more. And I will have news, hopefully, within the next week about our live show here in the Portland oh, yeah. area as to a location. Hopefully, we'll be getting on that very soon. So without further ado... I hope everyone has a wonderful week. Wonderful week. Enjoy the science, and we'll see you next week. And if you're a mermaid with the fish pipes on top, call me. <laughs>